uh, for this week, I wanted to rock and roll there. For this week, I wanted to go back over the material from last week. This is for TE826. And I'd given you some PowerPoints, and you remember the, uh, the example of the lady teaching in, in Persian language, uh, Farsi, and uh, then she had the little duck, etc. And what I wanted you, you to do in the discussion, I think I put down 10, I want you to have state 10 concepts or 10 things you learned and then how you translate that into practice in your classroom. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to talk around those points for right now. I've kind of made the PowerPoints um, the focus of this, but also anything else. Um, one of the things in the uh, chapter that I think was very important was uh, in one of the frames when it says, what do we know now about language learning? And that was on frame eight. Uh, what do we know now? Children learn language by unconsciously generating rules. So grammar is not taught as much as grammar is imprinted as people are exposed to it. Their brain naturally will eventually make sense of it. That's why, uh, why native speakers, when you try to ask them what are the rules for grammar, people will have to look at a handbook because they don't know what the rules are. They know what is right and what is wrong almost all the time, but they can't actually tell you the rule because we don't necessarily learn the rules. We learn patterns and they obey rules. Rules are the overt uh, grammarian explanation. We can't even be sure the grammarians have it right. They just have a rule that explains things. It may not be the way it is in the brain at all. But we know that we generate grammar, so exposure to language helps with the acquisition of grammar. Um, you learn the rules. We know that another one is that errors are good and meaningful thing. So that would mean if I asked you in your class, what does that mean? What are you going to do when kids make mistakes? What's your position on that? Punish them? Now, I understand when people have an opportunity to turn in homework. If they just do misspellings and they have problems like that, they should aim to try to do it well, especially written work. But in terms of in-class errors, how do you treat those errors? Does it become a negative thing? And if it does, if, if it becomes, if people are, um, if students are turned off, if it's like a French class and they kind of get in trouble or scolded or in some way it's a negative experience, they're going to shut down on you and they're not going to learn. So errors are to be not, not just tolerated, but understood. You don't want to encourage errors, but you want to encourage you don't want to see errors as a problem. So that, what's that mean to you as uh, a teacher working with ESL kids in fourth grade? How do you correct them? Or do you, do you, work, in group, do you work in groups and then have kids help each other come up with the right answers? You know, maybe you'll have a game or something and, and there'll be a group and if somebody has something slightly off, somebody will help them with it but it's a positive experience. So that's what I'm aiming for in this discussion this week, is how do you take what's on these PowerPoints and how do you translate those into something that is gonna promote learning in a positive environment. I gave the example of uh, the affective filter. If people are upset, or nervous, shy, that means their affective filter, their filter's up. It's more like a shield than a filter. A filter lets things through, but in this case, it kind of blocks everything. So we know that students are afraid to speak out in class. How can you develop um, exercises that help them? Maybe, uh, for example, you could do role playing, where it's kind of like you have a, like, you could do it pantomime the whole thing. But let's say there's a door up there a little door and you can knock on it and practice answering the door and then people come to the door with different, like a salesman comes to the door. Maybe that doesn't happen much anymore. It's more like annoying phone calls, but uh, cell phones obviously could have a big part in this. Um, but 
what kind of exercise could you surprise students with different situations but still help them learn and they could they could work on developing their expertise in the language as they're encountering new situations um, so you want to have a meaningful supportive and communicative setting and comprehensible input uh, communicative setting comprehensible input the stuff that you how you speak to students do you speak in a clear voice do you speak in a in a pleasant voice do you can you create interesting little opportunities for communication in the classroom i'm going to have videotapes you can watch you'll see it when you see the psyop there'll be a whole bunch of tapes and i'll put that up but I'd, i'm kind of holding that back for next week um realize that people understand more than they can say so your listening comprehension ability is much greater than your ability to produce language here's another little thing to remember you can't pronounce you can't make a sound if you can't hear the sound i did a little experiment i was listening to people uh actually went on the internet and i was listening to different languages and i found that those speaking uh the language used by those from Somalia that I, I couldn't understand the sound. I would hear it, but I could not comprehend how it was made. So that would be very big block for me. I would have to have some real practice with someone teaching me, where do you put your tongue? Where do you put your teeth? How do you make the sound? Is it, does it come from down here? Is it a voiceless sound or a voice sound? You know that rule, voice means your, your uh, the vocal cords are vibrating and the difference is B, 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 B. I think B is the voiced and, and B is the voiceless. Okay. Um, it's been a while since I've done, uh, done phonetics or had a class in pronunciation. So I have to remember kind of some of that, you know, that's why sometimes speech, speech therapists are useful with students that have difficulty picking up the sound. They, so you could use your speech therapist to help someone if, they, if there's a particular sound they're having difficulty with in English. Sometimes at UNK we have students come from different countries and they'll go, and they'll spend a little time with a speech therapist to work on certain sounds. For instance, the L and the R. The L and the R are two sounds in English. But in, in some Asian languages, maybe some other languages, they have a sound that is a combination of L and R. They don't distinguish, they just have one sound. And we distinguish it and we have the L and the R and that's why you get L and the R sounding like the same thing. So people pronounce the R when they're supposed to be saying the L word. And that causes people to get confused and they're listening to them. So they have to practice on that. That's a sound they have to work on. Uh, so if you don't know a sound, you need a little extra practice on it. And remember, if it's adults, they're going to have a harder time because they don't like to make mistakes. Some cultures, and this is the big deal about culture, cultures don't like, some cultures do not like mistake. Making mistake is, is, a, is a fault. It's a serious issue. And so you have to be aware of that, um, depending on where the student's from. And it takes a lot of time to be fluent. So patience with students. Now, younger the kids, the more fluent they'll become. Um, we used to think it's something to do with the brain, but I actually don't buy that anymore. I believe a, a 65 year old, if you could find one, haha, you could, uh, they could learn a language and be pretty fluent in it. Maybe not the same as a kid, you know, but they, but I've seen examples of, of older men who have become quite fluent in a different language, quite different from their own. So that's something to consider. Um, and then I like this one, you know, and I give you all this stuff about the history of different ways of teaching. Grammar translation, it's not useless. It's just not the best way to teach overall. But if you're going to teach writing, I think sometimes it's helpful to have students read something and then try to set it aside and then compose on their own. 
that's an old exercise that Benjamin Franklin, I think Abraham Lincoln, Jefferson people, they would read something in the proper English of, of the 18th century or 19th century, and then they would try to sit down and write the same thought and using their own vocabulary, not just rote memorization, but trying to, to get the same effect from the language. Um, that's really a nice little exercise. It's like, it's like bad plagiarism or uh, there's a contest people try to write like uh, Edgar Allan Poe or, or Hemingway. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to write like them, but they're trying to write badly for the humorous effect. So if you're not into literature or anything, you'd say, well, I don't recognize Heming how Hemingway would say something. Uh, he had a short chop, uh, short sentences that he used to create images and movement in his, uh, whereas Edgar Allan Poe had really long sentences, lots of uh, complicated, well, I'd call more difficult in more 19th century, early, early 19th century uh, lexicon, you know, vocabulary use. So as you go through this and you look at different things, you know, academic, what are you, what are you gonna learn from social versus academic? Um, social, the BICS, as it's called, B-I-C-F, Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills. You're going to say, um, when we're doing something like that, we're speaking in class, generally we're gonna use, uh, not necessarily, I wouldn't call it playground English, but basic conversational English. But when people write, unless they're characters and they're writing a fiction and they have to speak that way, they're going to use academic language when they write paragraph, paragraphs. And of course, when you get older, you want to speak more academically, like I'm doing now. I'm not speaking in conversational English. I'm looking down and, and, and talking about uh, vocabulary, lexicon, uh, word choice, uh, Adult language, I guess, is what I would call it, even though it's just more modified sometimes at the playground. Um, and precision in vocabulary that you use. Um, so remember that BIX is going to come on quickly. And if you're teaching kids in, in first and second grade, you won't have to teach basic and interpersonal communication skills if they are around native speakers of English and other students have learned English and have are conversant, they're going to pick up the language. You don't have to go and teach conversation. You're going, as a teacher, you're gonna be more focused on academic language, okay? So you're going to be teaching things like when we use, uh, what is the, you know, if we're talking about a short story and we talk about the setting, the uh, the hook that gets people interested in the first paragraph or two to continue reading, that is an academic concept. You know, it actually could be conversational, but we don't normally use that. Uh, the setting, the protagonist, antagonist, um, the climax of the story, the denouement, whatever. You know, the after the climax of the story, the end of the story, um, all kind, the mood, the tone. Words like that are normally not used in conversational English, it can be, but it's more specific to talking about short stories. Same thing with the vocabulary for mathematics, geography. Um, conversationally, you don't use the word plateau very much. It's more of an academic word. You could say growth in the economy has plateaued as a verb, and that would be kind of fancy, you know. Uh, but it doesn't mean a plateau in geography. It means that there's been a flattening of, of uh, economic growth or something. So what I would say to you here is I would like you to think as you're looking at these cre creatively, cre creatively in the uh, discussion, I would like you to come up with 10 examples of a term like that. Could be calps, could be any of these. And how would you um, how would you give instruction in that? Just give it a shot. You know, I don't expect you to be experts on everything, 
but I want you to use the the application of what we're learning here, how it might impact where, what you're teaching, most all of you are teaching in the classroom. So you're familiar with changing words and, and changing expectations in an assignment to either make it more demanding or less demanding or more uh, differentiated. Um, that's another term, differentiated. If you want to bring that up, I'm mentioning it here. Um, so that's one thing. And the other part that I wanted to talk a little bit about, I dropped it down here, is I gave, I gave you this uh, about ELLs in Nebraska schools. And mainly what I want to talk about here, I don't think I, well, second and first language acquisition, that you know that language is learned at home, the first language, second language usually learned in school. Um, there's not pressure to learn the first language a baby gets all the time in the world. Um, they're taught by other kids. They learn it watching TV, interacting with parents and aunts and uncles and friends and play, and, play, and that's the playground English, the Bix. But the second language is often learned as an academic language. Um, you got to take into account the personality of students, um, their motivation. How are you going to motivate students? Uh, what about access to their, can you get bilingual books? Here's something. I, at one point in here, I'm going to show you a lot of books I've got, children's books. And where do you get books like that? And what would be the value of having a bilingual book? Well, one is the parents could read it to the kid in their first language if you happen to have a first language, second language English combination on the same, in the same uh, book. So that would be something that you could, that you could uh, present, you could promote literacy at home and literacy with the parents. Now, if you have parents that speak a language that you don't have any books in that language, which is possible, let's say Arabic, um, then maybe the parents would speak English or maybe some brothers and sisters in there. You're always gonna work with limitations. You, you may, because we happen to have a large Hispanic population in the United States, and a lot of people study Spanish, there's a lot of bilingual books. But I happen to have one in Turkish and English, but that's pretty rare. But you can actually go online and look for books like that. A place to look is called um, uh, Art, uh, Arte Publico, which is University of Houston books. You can find bilingual books, especially in Spanish. But you can just Google and find all kinds of things. If you just look bilingual books and then put whatever language it is. Certainly Chinese you can find. In uh, Japanese, you can find bilingual books in that. Now, you won't be able to read it, especially if it's in the traditional language. But the parents could, and then it would be still, it would build real positive relationships. Another thing, just something I want to bring up now, is you can sometimes create your own books and have parents help with that. you got parents who are really um, creative. They could actually create little books and then, uh, you know, print them out and, and get them published. You don't have to send them off to be bound. You could find them maybe in some informal way, and you can actually create little reading books and laminate them or something for kids. Um, trying to think of other things. You know, one thing I mentioned in here, it's in the one on uh, ELLs, is language modification techniques. Now, this is something I think is really useful. Um, always face students. You know, note, what do you notice about yourself? Do you tend to speak low? Do you do you not have a teacher's voice? Or do you notice with, if you work with ELLs, you really have to have a very uh, comprehensible voice. Not use slang, not that that would be an issue. But with, uh, with students learning English as a second language, you have to repeat a lot and paraphrase more than you normally would. So if you say something like, here's, uh, please be quiet, or you may have some nonverbal signals for that. Now, elementary teachers probably know all this, I'm sure. 
but maybe older teachers don't think about this. But you, but you have to, I always think the best teachers, I don't, don't want to offend anybody, but elementary teachers are often the best teachers because they have to adjust to everything. They don't get to say, hey, that kid's not ready, send him back to kindergarten. They get him in first grade, whether or not. So um, other things are idiomatic expressions like, hey, you let the horses out of the barn. That's not going to mean anything. Um, I can give you expressions like that in Spanish, and you would literally understand them and say, well, I don't understand. What does that mean? You know, what's an onion have to do with this? <laughs> and then, of course, it makes no sense at all because it's an expression that people in the culture know. So again, we're back in culture. Uh, give students a lot of wait time or throw in, uh, sometimes there's a tendency people will keep rephrasing the question and not give the students wait time. Silence is okay. That's something very important. I think especially in high school, if you're working with ESL or if you're teaching a history class and you have ELL students in your class, EL students, you want to give them opportunity to respond. You may want to create little groups to where students uh, work together to come up with responses. You know, it depends on which, what works for you. Um, I like to have students help students, that's useful. Then you want to have mixed groups and you might think about grouping. Mixed groups, you may have a native speaker uh, of English in a say a class, you have some ELLs in a regular class and so you kind of mix them in and you want to think about that because you want people to be compatible. So you don't want someone doing all the work in a group. You want it to blend. So that's something else to be considered. Um, I mentioned the thing about idiomatic and you always have to think of culture. Something very important here is uh, all kinds of relationships, male, female relationships that may be uh, have certain rules in another culture. If you have students mixed group in your class, um, I've noticed sometimes depending on where students are from, they may not be, uh, I, will, I won't say they're not respectful, but I'll say they don't, they don't um, feel comfortable with women teaching them. And then that causes an issue. Now they have to get comfortable because we're not gonna change the teachers out to suit them. But you have to be aware that that could be an issue. And there may be some conflict there. That's something to think about. Uh, obviously, uh, physical distance, you know, raising your voice, where students may be speaking louder than they should, may be cultural, or it may not be. Um, it, there's always a tendency to take everything at its face value and assume that they're communicating with your rules, but maybe they don't. Some cultures may be a little louder than other cultures, or they may be just the reverse. They may be so silent, they shake their head yes to everything, and they're not understanding. So then what do you as a teacher do? You, ha you can't assume that they know it because they shook their head or they didn't ask questions. Um, that then you may have to do quizzes, you may, have to, you may have to pose questions, you may get them a small group, and sometimes having a native speaker with another native speaker who is more fluent is helpful too. Um, it doesn't bother me if people use their first language in the classroom. I'm, not, I'm totally not into forbidding the use of their first language. And that's something that's a real sensitive issue. People say, hey, I don't want to hear that your language out in the hallway. Um, I believe in free speech, and I don't believe you promote a positive experience if you try to clamp down on their first language. Um, when people speak in their language, they're not necessarily saying things about you. Uh, they could be, but you know, if you're paranoid about it, you, it's always wise to have somebody who speaks the other language. I've had this happen to me. Students would say something, and I wouldn't pick it up, even though I spoke some Spanish. I didn't pick up all the slang, because I wouldn't know the slang, depending on where they're from. And I didn't necessarily spend a lot of time learning all the dirty words in Spanish conversational, you know. So I 
you'd have a kid say something, then catch them at it, then check and say, what is that word? And then you find out, and then you find out that the kid's going to be in trouble because they're using language they shouldn't use, being naughty, I guess. Um, so as you look through this, um, uh, the, there's a little bit, I think, in here about proficiency levels and that you always want to challenge students. You want to do the old Vygotsky thing. You want to be just a little ahead of their learning curve so they have to stretch themselves out. Uh, that's where the skill of being a teacher is, is really uh, earned or is practiced, is knowing how far you can push them and what they're capable of, what they're not quite ready to do, okay? It's like an athlete, um, how many, how many setups can they do? Well, that's pretty old fashioned, but you know, how many weights can they lift and in what fashion, what way they can lift those weights. So, um, so anyhow, that's just some of the things I wanted to bring up from PowerPoints. Uh, I do, uh, I do have a thing on culture, which I don't think, I'm using it in the 804 class. I may share it with you because it's useful. I think you've had 804 already, but if you haven't, and if you're just getting the endorsement, some, some knowledge about culture is useful. Um, and I'll just go through very quickly on that. I may put up the PowerPoint on that. And these PowerPoints are something you can download and print them out and just use them. They're really useful for exercises. For instance, concepts of time, you know, what is being late? You know, we expect punctuality. I ran into somebody from Switzerland one time. When they said punctual, they meant to the second. If the teacher didn't start the class exactly at 8 a.m., they were complaining immediately. None of this one or two minutes after eight and then close the door and start the class. They were upset about it. And it even offended me. And I, and I thought, my gosh, you know, I thought it was a stereotype about Swiss timepieces and time and being very much on time, which I assume maybe Europeans were more, more, you know, more strict about never being tardy. But this person put, put Americans to shame. They, so I was kind of shocked by that. They were, and then we have other people like, you know, country people like my, some relatives of mine, you know, they, they sometimes are 15, 20 minutes late and they say they're going to show up because they saw a friend, they have to talk, they have to socialize. It's important that you not skip over people. You have to give them a little bit of your time, even if they're going to be late for an appointment. Um, teachers tend not to buy that excuse, but, but you know you have an aunt or a relative that's always an hour late. You know, Why don't uh, parties start on time? Well, some cultures... You may say it's supposed to start at eight, but it won't start till nine or 10. And if you're familiar with that pattern, you know that's culture. That's not an attempt to, it's not a sign of being lazy or, uh, or disrespectful. That's just with time. Attitudes about nature, about rain, about, you know, I know country people and people that live in large cities have different concepts of time. And also about nature, you know, they don't let, if it's going to rain, they'll leave early. They'll make sure they're, they are someplace on time. Um, some places, if it rains, people cancel their plans or if it's going to snow. You know, the kids always love to have some threat of snow and they're hoping school be called off. They're looking and they try not to call off school. Um, but Attitudes about nature, attitudes about time, attitudes about male-female relationships, um, attitudes about authority. Um, in other words, is, is, the, is, is the person in charge totally in charge, or is there what's called a small distance? In other words, in European countries, no one is considered so powerful they can just order people around and you're expected to obey them. But in some cultures, it's very authoritarian. And generally, I say Americans don't like authoritarian people. People try to order you around and show who's boss. That's not, that's not good. But we know in the military, that's different. We accept that within that concept. 
uh, certainly in the in in the uh, operational theater when there's surgery, the doctor is in charge. No one crosses the doctor. You do he, whatever th he or she wants to do. That's what you do. You know, that's the chain of command there. Uh, you as teachers dealing with being unable to come to school because your kid is sick. You may have a superintendent or principal that's very, gets upset if you're absent too much or if something happens. So those are things we work out in our culture. And some cultures, people are very laid back and other cultures, they get very upset. So I just want to, I just wanted to hit on some of those for you. If I, um, culture is a really interesting area. It's in 804 class and it could have some stuff that's useful to you. Uh, one last thing I want to mention before I shut up is nonverbal signals, frowning, uh, staring at people. This is very powerful stuff. Staring at people is weird in our culture. We generally look at you and then we look away. We don't stare at someone for several minutes. And if we think someone's staring at us, we think it's some kind of a threat. In some cultures, it's a real serious and very aggressive when you tell someone, look at me in the eye when I talk to you, that's actually offensive to them. That's even within American culture, depending on what group you're working with. You don't, you don't use that. Um, looking away from someone in many cultures is a sign of, or looking down is a sign of respect. So uh, don't, don't run out with your little version of how the world should be and expect everybody to go along with that. Not everybody shakes hands. Not everybody's allowed to make physical contact in any way. Conversational tone can be different, can be loud, it can be quiet. Uh, Nonverbal behavior can be really different. And you know all kinds of hand signals and the fingers can be what, what is perfectly fine in one culture is a terrible offense in another. The same with vocabulary words. Some words we use, it, the same word used in in Australia is a terrible offensive term, and you're not allowed to use it, okay? Um, I think I know what it is, but I'm not gonna utter it. But in, in America, we don't even realize it's even an offense. We just think it's just nothing. So um, even people that speak the same language can have very different culture. Okay, I hope this has been helpful. I just wanted to take a little time to let you absorb that stuff because we're going to start on PSYOP next week. And um, then we also have that book on differentiation. I did find out that Rothenberg book is out of print. That's the one that's out of print. I think somebody told me it was the other one, but Rothenberg's the one's out of print. So if you get a copy of that, it'll be a miracle. Uh, the other one is in print, the Tomlinson book. But any kind of differentiation is fine. I'm going to have some PowerPoints on it. So thank you, and I'll try to... Quiet, and I hope this is helpful to you.